Okay, good morning. Uh, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 13 this morning where we're going to introduce the Antichrist. And so I'd like to pray and ask the Lord to protect us because, as you know, my camera just fell off the tripod, which never happens. And so I knew, oh, here we go. So let's pray real quickly. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence now in the name of Jesus Christ under his shed blood. We do pray, Lord, that if you would protect us from the evil one, uh, I pray that you put a hedge of protection around our church building. And Lord, allow me to preach the truth of Revelation 13 without any satanic interference. We thank you, Lord, for how good you are. Thank you that we have the living Savior. And Lord, in Jesus Christ, we're not deceived. We pray now that you be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, Revelation 13. We're going to be introduced to the Antichrist. The Antichrist, anti means against or in place of. Satan hates God. Satan hates Jesus Christ. Satan wants the world to worship Satan himself. He doesn't want us to worship the Lord. And so Satan, all these centuries after centuries, he's been doing things to try to disrupt the ministry of God's Word around the world. So now God's finally going to give Satan his, his wish to try to rule the world for seven years. He's going to come on the scene in the Antichrist, the beast. He is going to be a person who's very charismatic. He's going to be a person who is probably really good looking. He's going to be a person who's a financial whiz. He's going to be a person who comes in peace. He's going to be a person the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. He's going to have signed a, a peace treaty with Israel and the, and the Muslims and the Palestinians and all those different folks will, will get along with Israel and Israel will get along with them for three and a half years. It's going to be a false peace. He's going to take care of the financial woes around the world. Everybody's going to fall down and worship him. Somewhere during that time, he's going to receive a fatal head wound. And he's going to appear to come back from the dead. We don't know if it's a real death or it's going to be a fake death, but the whole world, because of who he is and how, how wonderful he appears to be in the eyes of mankind, they're going to all fall down and not just think he's great. They're going to start worshiping him. I'd like to read real quickly from the, a, a book titled Revelation by Dr. Harry Einside, and he describes the Antichrist, what he's like. A man is being waited for. His advent draws near. He will come when at last the restraining power of the Holy Spirit has gone up to the heavens where he came, from whence he came. This coming one is the grand monarch of the new humanity cult. He is the coming imam or Mahdi of the Muslims. He is the long expected last incarnation of Vishnu waited for by the Brahmins the coming Montezuma of the Aztecs, the false Messiah of the apostate Jews, the great master of all the sects of the yogis, the ultimate man of the evolutionists, the ubermensch of Nietzsche, the Hun philosopher whose ravings prepared the way for the, for the world war. He will be a Satan-controlled, God-defying, conscious, conscienceless, almost super, superhuman man, an individual whose manifestation will mean the consummation of the present apostasy and the full deification of humanity to its bewildered dupes. Thus the world will turn away from the Christ of God and stretch out eager hands to welcome this coming man of sin and depend upon it. He will be on time. God's Word has declared His advent as surely as it predicts the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ from glory. He's going to be a flashy. He's going to be a charismatic. He's going to be a smart person. He's going to make, he's going to make promises to people all over the world. He'll have control probably of all the mass media. He will make promises as Adolf Hitler did during World War II. And people are so, going to be so hungry for a man of answers. They're going to flock to Him. And so I want to go to Revelation chapter 13, and I want to look at verse 1, his ancestry. Then I stood on the sand of the sea. Some, some manuscripts say he stood on the sand of the sea. I go with, I stood on the sand of the sea. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And so his ancestry is that he comes, he comes rising up out of the sea of humanity. 
And he has 10 horns and has uh, on his horns 10 crowns and on his head blasphemies. And what is that blas a blasphemous name? What's a blasphemous name? God. He's going to call himself God. And so when he rises up in verse 1, he says, I saw a beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now, when you take the, the different seven world powers, you have, you have Egypt, uh, Israel was in bondage there for 400 years. Then you had the Assyrians. They came and conquered the whole northern kingdom, the, tw the ten tribes of Israel, carried them off. We never heard from them again. Then you had Babylon come to take the southern kingdom, which was Judah and Benjamin. And they carried them off as slaves against their will to Babylon, the ones that they didn't kill. And then you have Medo-Persia who came in and conquered the Babylonians when Belshazzar was the king. And then you have Greece under Alexander the Great. And then you have Rome, which was horrible. That's where the Emperor Nero uh, killed Apostle Paul, had his head chopped off, and they, tradition says he crucified Peter upside down. And then he burnt down Rome and he blamed it on the Christians. And so then you have Rome, and then you have the seventh one is the revived Roman Empire under the Antichrist. So you have these seven beasts and they're, they're actually empires. Looking at them from God's point of view, they're like wild animals. And so he comes up out of that. Then we have his authority in verse 2. Now, the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. And his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. Now, he talks about three different animals there. And it says... Uh, his, his, this beast was like a leopard. Now he's looking at the empires that came before Rome when Daniel talked about them. When Daniel talked about them, he talked about Babylon first, which was like a lion. Then he talked about a bear raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth, and that was Medo-Persia. And then he talked about a, a leopard that had four wings, and he was talking about uh, Greece under Alexander the Great. Daniel was looking to the future, which had, which had not happened yet. John is looking back to the past of what has already happened. So he takes them in opposite order. And so instead of taking uh, uh, Babylon first, he takes Greece first. So the beast, was, which I saw, was like a leopard, like, like uh, Greece under Alexander the Great. His feet were like the feet of a bear, which would be Medo-Persia. His mouth was like the mouth of a lion, which would be Babylon. What he's saying is this beast was like the worst of all of them. He's the worst of all of them. And you could start taking all the different di evil dictators and murderers or whatever, put them all together, and it spells the beast. And so you have his it's ancestry, then you have his authority in verse 2, then you have his acclaim in verse 3. And I saw, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled, and they followed the beast. So there you have this beast of the, these empires coming up out of the sea of humanity. And it has ten horns, which are ten rulers or ten kingdoms during the time of the Antichrist. One of them is going to get killed or appear to get killed. And then he's going to appear to rise again from the dead. Now, if you go from there over to verse 12 of chapter 13, it says, And he exercised all the, the false prophet exercise all the authority of the first beast in his presence and who caused the, the earth to, and those who dwell on it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So we know out of those ten horns, which are the same as the ten toes of the big, uh, the big statue that, that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream in Daniel chapter 2, one of those toes is the beast and he's going to have a fatal head wound. Now, is he really killed or do they just say that he's killed? I don't know. But it's going to be a fake resurrection from the dead. The Antichrist is going to be a fake Jesus. And as we saw 
when we read just a minute ago from Dr. Ironside. He's going to be the person that all these false religions are looking for. They think there's going to be their own type of Messiah, and they're going to welcome him thinking that he's their true Messiah. He's not. He's a fake Jesus. Not that they're all looking for Jesus, but they're all looking for some, some great leader who's going to come in the future. Well, he's going to be their great leader. And so you have his ancestry in verse 1, you have his authority in verse 2, you have his acclaim in verse 3. The whole world is going to seek after him. Now, it takes for granted that there are going to be some people who are going to turn to Jesus Christ as their Messiah during that time. They're not going to follow him. Many of those people are going to die. Some of those people God will protect. Some of those people who do not die during the last half of the tribulation period, then they will go on into the millennium and we will rule and reign over them. So at this point, when the beast is arriving, we're going to eventually move to the midpoint where after he's made a peace treaty with Israel, he will break that treaty. He will go into the Jewish temple, which he is allowed to be rebuilt. He will go into the temple and he will declare himself to be God. Now, as I said before, he'll probably have control of all the, the media worldwide with satellite TV and everything that we have. And he will declare, you will worship no one except me. And that's called the abomination, abomination of desolation. He will declare himself to be God. Now, if you're a person who has rejected Jesus Christ, if you're listening on Facebook or YouTube, if you rejected Jesus Christ, you have been deceived by Satan into rejecting him. In John chapter 8, as we've said many, many times, Jesus describes Satan is as a deceiver and a murderer. His goal for you is to deceive you into thinking you don't need Christ. And then his goal is to see you die in your sin and go to hell. People who reject Christ are deceived. Many times their eyes spiritually are blinded. They can't tell the truth from fiction. And so there are going to be people all over the world who've rejected Christ and they will willingly, excitedly follow the beast. They will follow the Antichrist and they will do whatever he tells them to do. And eventually he's going to say, you can't buy or sell anything without having my mark on your hand or on my forehead. And if you don't have that mark, you can't buy or you can't sell. And those people who reject that, he's going to try to kill them. If you take the mark of the beast, then you will not be forgiven for that because you have identified yourself as a follower of Satan and you will not be able to be forgiven. You will go to hell and burn in the lake of fire for eternity because you took that mark. Now, if you have some other type of thing, let's say if you work for a big corporation and they put some kind of little chip right here, I'm not saying that's the mark of the beast because he hasn't arrived yet. They're putting chips in dogs and cats. So if your cat or dog gets lost, they, you take down the vet, they'll run a scanner over it, and it'll tell you who, what the dog's name is, and who he belongs to, where he lives, and the phone number, and they can find your dog or cat. There are people today in certain big corporations, they're lining up to get chips. And they walk in, they don't have to have a clock or anything, they just walk in, go under the scanner, and they, the door's open for them. If it's top secret, they just get scanned and the, the top secret stuff opens up to them. I'm not into all that. They're not going to put a chip in me unless it's Fritos. <laughs> I can eat Fritos. My mom used to take, I'm on a rabbit trail here. My mom used to take a block of cream cheese and she used to take a big thing of garlic salt and she would blend that all up and give us a bag of Fritos. Man, I could live on that. It, if you hadn't had cream cheese with garlic salt and Fritos, you hadn't lived. So his acclaim is in verse 3, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and they followed the beast because they think that was the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So they worship the dragon. Who's the dragon? That's Satan. He's the false father. There's a false trinity during the tribulation period. Satan is the false father. The beast or the antichrist is the fake Jesus. And the false prophet, we're going to read about in a minute, is the fake Holy Spirit. 
Satan tries to impersonate God. Satan wants to fool you. It says Satan many times appears as an angel of light, and no wonder his servants also can appear as angels of righteousness. So when I worked at hospice for 11 years, I had numerous people say, well, I, I, I died, I think, and I left my body, and I, and I could see this bright light, and I was moving toward the bright light, and then I heard this voice says, not yet, go back. The only problem is the guy had denied Christ. And I said, well, don't follow the bright light because the Bible says Satan often appears as an angel of light. You don't put your faith in some bright light. It might be the headlight on the train, but you place your faith in Jesus Christ and what God says in the Word of God. The next thing we have is not only his ancestry, his authority, his acclaim, but in verse 4, his adoration. So they worship the dragon, Satan, who gave authority to the beast, the Antichrist, and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? They're saying this guy is the ultimate world leader. You'd be a fool to make war with him because you can't beat him. And so he brings in for the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, he brings in a false peace. He's a man of peace. He's a man who says what everybody wants to hear. He's a great speaker. He's very charismatic in his, uh, in his personality. He's the kind of person that people look at and think, this is almost like King David in the Bible. He's the kind of man that everyone will want to follow. And they're all going to worship the beast. Well, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says you're already a child of Satan. I've asked people many times, if Satan could offer you anything on this earth as a gift, if he could offer you something so that you would eventually die and go to hell, if he gives you this wonderful gift, would you do it? And people say, oh no, I wouldn't do it. I, I, can't, I can't think of anything. I'd, hey, if you've rejected Christ, you've already taken it. Well, what is that gift Satan's offered you? To be God yourself. To be your own God, you want to run your life. I had this one guy one time, and he was into drugs and everything else. And, and I think I mentioned this one time. I asked him, I said, uh, would you worship me as God? He says, what? He said, no. I wouldn't say what he really, Hope told me not to say what he really said. He said, no. I said, should I worship you as God? He said, if you're stupid. I said, you know, but you've already told me you, you don't want to have anything to do with Jesus Christ. Why? Because you're worshiping yourself as God. So that makes you stupid. If you're living on this earth and you are just wonderful and you like your life and you're just living independently of God and you think, well, I'm a nice person. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to make it. I think, I'm good, I, th I think I'm good enough to make it to heaven. No, you're not. You can't be good enough unless you're like Jesus Christ. You're not like Jesus Christ. You can't be good enough to earn salvation. Only Jesus Christ can earn your salvation by shedding his blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness or redemption or remission because the life is in the blood. If they smothered him or choked him to death, you couldn't be forgiven. If they hung him, we couldn't be forgiven. His blood had to be shed. And so these people are going to follow the Antichrist as if he is God. Then we have not only his ancestry, his authority, his acclaim, and his adoration, but we have his arrogance in verses 5 and 6. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. He was speaking great things that people wanted to hear. And he was blaspheming God. He was saying negative things about God. He was saying negative things about God's people. He was saying negative things about the Word of God. And so we have people ruling our nation today doing the same thing. Now I'm going to say something that's going to be really unpopular. Most people who support the current administration support him because of several things. One, they may like the alternative lifestyle. They want to maintain that. Two, they think it's okay to murder babies. They like that. 
free. They like a, lot of, like a lot of free things from the government and they're all prone to socialism because they're too lazy to go to work. And you go out here and around town, you see signs up everywhere, now hiring, now hiring, because so many people don't want to work anywhere. And so you have people who, people who like evil. They hate the police officers. They support the, the rioters. Okay, They all support the current administration. And some people say, well, I think you're being judgmental. Yes, I am. And I'm right. Now, there are people who are just ignorant. Now, who are ignorant people? Well, I vote for this type of administration because my, my daddy voted that way, my mama, da my granddaddy voted that way, my great-granddaddy voted that way, and I'll always vote that way. Well, it's not the same party it used to be. So there are people today who are so easily deceived they would vote for a monkey if he could say the right things and provide the right things for them. So we have, he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Now he's already gone through the first 42 months, three and a half years. Now he's going to declare himself to be God and he's going to go for another three and a half years. Except the first three and a half years, there was a false peace and everybody thought he was the greatest thing that ever lived. But the last three and a half years, he's going to declare himself to be God. And if you don't worship him, you're going to die. And anybody who turns to Jesus as their Messiah during that time, they're going to die or he's going to try to kill them. Some people will survive because there are people all over this world. There are people who are Christians who live in Papua New Guinea out in the jungle. He can't kill them all. And so some of those people, we will rule over them when we come into the millennial kingdom. We rule and reign over them with him. The, so we have verse, uh, verse 5. And then verse 6, then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. He hates the name of Jesus Christ. He hates the name of Jehovah. He hates the God that we love. He blasphemes his name, his tabernacle. He hates the fact that Jesus Christ shed his blood and placed his blood on the altar in heaven. He hates all of that. And those who dwell in heaven, he hates us. Because we'll be dwelling in heaven at that time. He hates God's people who are in heaven with him. And so then we go down to his, not only his arrogance, but his activity in verse 7. He was granted, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Now you say saints, they're talking about us. Now anybody who belongs to Jesus Christ is set apart as God's child. And there are going to be people who didn't know Christ when the, when, the revela when the tribulation started. But during that time, they were going to hear 144,000 Jewish evangelists preaching. And many people are going to turn to the Messiah and they're going to reject the mark of the beast. And he's going to try to kill anybody who didn't take that mark. But some people will escape. And authority was given him over every tribe tongue and nation. He's going to rule the entire world. When you go to the United Nations, he is going to be top dog and he's going to call the shots and everyone will fall in line. And if they don't, they will die. All who dwell on the earth. Oh, okay. Then we go down to the last part, his admirers. We have his ancestry, we have his authority, we have his acclaim, we have his adoration, we have his arrogance, we have his activity, and then in verses 8 through 10, we have his admirers. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, here we go. Southern Baptist hate five-point Calvinists. He's a Calvinist. He's a Calvinist. Well, what a lot of people don't realize if you're a Southern Baptist, there's a lot of things that the Calvinists believe that you also believe. But you just hate Calvinists because everybody says you ought to hate a Calvinist. God chose you before the foundation of the world. Well, I can't buy that. That's Calvinism. I like, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, 
starting in verse 3 through 6. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him. When? When I was 17 years old? He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Before He had created anything. Now why did He choose us? I don't know. Somebody would say, well, He chose because he, he knew that we would be the ones who got saved. Other people would say, no, He chose because that was His divine choice. I put it this way. I am responsible to come to Christ. God holds me responsible. If I reject Christ, I'm going to burn in hell for eternity. But God is responsible for His sovereignty, not me. What God chooses, He chooses. And I have no control over that. I can't ask God, as, as Nebuchadnezzar said, he, he, Nebuchadnezzar learned to, to uh, worship the, the God of the, of, the, uh, of the heavens, who no one says, what are you doing? We're not to say, what, God, what are you up to? What are you doing? Well, God can choose you before the foundation of the world if He wants you. Why? I don't know. But it does say in Revelation, in chapter 13, in chapter verses 8 through 10, it says, All who dwell on the earth will worship Him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So God planned before the world was ever created for Jesus Christ to die on the cross, and God chose before the foundation that some of us are going to be saved. If anyone has an ear to hear, he who leads into captivity will go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Now what's that talking about? I believe this. Those people who haven't taken the mark of the beast, there are a lot of people who are going to die. When Jesus went to the cross, he went like a lamb to the slaughter. He opened not his mouth. He was obedient to the Father. If anyone has an ear to hear, <clears throat> let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. So if, God, if, if you're going to be arrested and put in jail, don't pitch a fit, just go. He who kills with a sword must be killed. If you're going to fight, if you're going to try to fight the Antichrist and everything, you're going to get killed. So God said, don't do that. With the sword, he must be killed with the sword. And then he says, he who, I mean, here is the, the patience, here is the patience and faith of the saints. What does that mean? It means that during this time, we're not to try to fight. We're to suffer for Christ willingly. And that shows the, our patience and our faith in the Lord. You have people back during the time of the gladiators where Christians will be rounded up. They'd be taken into the arena and they would be murdered. Many times they would pray and they would die for Christ. And they said that so many Christians were killed by lions and stuff that pretty soon the wild animals would stop attacking them because they got sick of the taste of human flesh. So many people died for Christ. And so at this time, those people who turn to Messiah, many of them will be killed or many of them will be jailed or whatever. And he says, here is the patience and faith of the saints. That they're willing to endure suffering for Christ. Then we're going to move on to the, the false prophet. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 13, God warned Israel in many places, but this is just one of them, not to follow false prophets. So I'm going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 13, starting at verse five, uh, verses 1 through 5. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known. Let us serve them. 
You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God, and you fear Him, and you keep His commandments. <coughs> Excuse me. And obey His voice. You shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away from e the evil from your midst. I'd like to read from John MacArthur. He talks about this false prophet. Several vices characterize false prophets apart from the obvious one of the te of teaching of lies. Scripture denounces them as wicked in Jeremiah 23.11. They're called adulterers in Jeremiah 23.14. They're described as greedy in Ezekiel 22.25, Micah 3.11, 2 Peter 2.15. Self-deceived in Ezekiel 13.2-3 and idolaters in Jeremiah 2.8 and 23.13. Not surprisingly, God will judge them severely. Deuteronomy 18.20 pronounces the death sentence on them. He says, The prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Numbers 31.8, Jeremiah 23.15, and Jeremiah 29, verses 21 through 22. Now, we have people today who are in some like charismatic movements who believe, well, uh, I can prophesy, uh, God told me this. God can speak to your heart. But if they says, God told me this. God said, you must go over here. You must do this. Or this is going to happen. Uh, Jesus is going to come back on September the 30th. That's happened a lot of times. And they say, oh, I missed it by one year. So he's come back next year on September the 30th. He missed it again. We have a lot of people today who will come up to you, and I've had people tell me this. When Heather was in the hospital, we thought she was dying when she was six, six years old. During Christmas. This Pentecostal preacher who didn't know me from Adam's house cat, he came walking in the, in the room and he says, the reason your daughter is dying is because God told me there's sin in your life. I said, you don't even know me. He says, yeah, but there's sin in your life. That's the reason your daughter's sick. And I said, I tell you what, there's sin in everybody's life if you're a Christian. You're not living a perfect life. But if you don't get out of here, I'm going to throw you out of this third story window and there's going to be sin in my life. Somebody says, well, your, uh, your, your loved one died because you didn't have enough faith. Well, if you had enough faith, if according to them, they'd live forever and never die. I have a dear friend. I love him with all my heart. He says, Brother Jim, you need to start a healing ministry. You can fill that church up with a healing ministry. And I want you to read this book. It's all about healing. I started reading the book. Guy has, guy has a lot of good things to say, but then I realized his wife died of cancer. I said, well, if, he, if this guy's got the gift of healing, why didn't, he heal his, why didn't he heal his wife from cancer? If you got the gift of healing, why don't you go to the hospital, go to the... Go to the uh, Veterans Hospital and unload it. You have faith healers on television. They say, oh, we're going to heal you. What's wrong? Uh, I, I'm hard of hearing. So they cast it out. And he gets down in the guy's ear and say, uh, say baby. And he goes, baby. Say baby, baby. All right, so he, he heals a guy of being deaf. Or a person's got uh, some type of uh, uh, vision problem and they, they see better. But you don't see people eaten up with fourth stage cancer coming in and being healed. You don't have people who have Lou Gehrig's disease and they're in a bed and they cannot move anything except their eyes and their mind is perfectly normal. You don't see them getting healed. You don't see someone coming in in a wheelchair with cerebral palsy and you don't see them getting healed. Because there's a lot of phony people out there today. And a lot of people were going to be taken in by that. So when I worked at Sears after class when I was in college, I was working in the hardware department, and Mr. Burpo, a black guy named Mr. Burpo, he worked down there. He says, 
hey, Jim, you going down to the city auditorium tonight to hear Reverend so-and-so? And I says, no, nah. I said, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> he said, I'm going, I believe in that cat, he heals people. I said, well, that's great. I'm glad that you like him, but he's probably not going to heal anybody with cerebral palsy tonight, and he's probably not going to heal anybody who's dying of cancer. He might heal somebody who's got a short leg or a long leg. At least it looks like he's healed them. A lot of that stuff is staged. There are a lot of deceivers out there. And so he says, <clears throat> Peter spoke the judgment of God on all such false teachers when he wrote that they will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. 2 Peter 2, 12 through 13 and verse 17. And so we go to the false prophet. I'm going to go through here a little more quickly. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. Now, I don't know what the significance of the earth is. Maybe it's the world system. I don't know. Another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Here's a lamb who see, appears to be innocent. This guy's going to appear to be innocent, but he has horns, which is a symbol of authority or power. He's going to come up with horns like a lamb and he's going to speak like a dragon. So he's going to come and he's going to appear to be so holy and so comforting and so nice and gentle, except he's going to say things that Satan wants him to say to deceive people into following the Antichrist. He's like the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit came to speak of me, not of himself. Talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will come and speak of me. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to draw people to Christ. Well, the ministry of the false prophet is to draw people to the Antichrist. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Oh my goodness, this is the Messiah. He performed great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Remember the two witnesses? They could call down fire from heaven and burn people up. He's going to try to do the same thing. You remember uh, when Moses went into Egypt? threw his staff on the ground and the, the, the Egyptians threw their staffs on the ground and turned into snakes and he threw his on the ground and it swallowed theirs up. And he deceived those who dwell on the earth by the signs which he was granted to do. God allowed him to do it in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. They're going to make a statue of him. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. It's going to be like some kind of a live robot. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So if you don't bow down and worship that image, you're going to be, you're going to be killed. And remember they made that stupid law that anybody who prays to anyone but the king for 30 days will die. Or every time the dance band cranks up, you're supposed to worship a Nebuchadnezzar's statue. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and, then no, and, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has that mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, I don't know if it's going to be a microchip or what it's going to be. And I don't remember if I showed you the video or not. I, maybe, I, maybe I did for some. There's a scientist from Israel who said that we may be the last generation of true homo sapiens. They have the technology now to inject what you would call spyware into the human body. I was reading to Hope yesterday, I think it was. They call it uh, computer dust or something like that. They have computers the size of a grain of sand. Really? Yeah. 
And this guy was saying that the 21st century will be the benchmark of when we are able to control people because of COVID-19. I heard it from his lips. He shared that with the World Economic Summit in front of that whole gang of world leaders. My guess is the reason they're pushing everybody to get that shot is because they want to inject that stuff into you, according to that scientist. You have the 5G cell phones, 5G towers. We don't have it around here. I have a 5G phone, but it only, record, I mean, it only works in 4G. They can change that just a little bit, that 5G, from what I've been told, and kill people. I don't know. We're living in a time when the world is getting all set for the Antichrist to come on the scene. If any of you want, uh, or doubt what I'm saying about that video, I'll show it to you. Or I'll, te I'll text it to you. It's pretty sobering. Guy's very brilliant. He lives in Jerusalem with his husband. Yeah, husband. And so he says, <clears throat> he causes all men, both, all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on the right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. It says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. What does that number mean? I don't know. Number seven is the number of completion or perfection. Only God has that. Man's number would be six. We're not quite up there with God. And if you have somebody who's so powerful, he's not just six, he's 666. And people have taken different names of different people and they'll find out, you know, this letter is number what, and this letter, and then add it all up to 666. They've done that with a lot of different people over the years. They still don't know who the Antichrist is. In closing, I'm going to read from uh, John Phillips on, in my book here, page 57. <clears throat> and he says, The dynamic appeal of the false prophet will lie in his skill in combining political expediency with religious passion. His arguments will be subtle, convincing, and appealing. His oratory will be hypnotic, for he will be able to move the masses to tears or whip them into a frenzy. He will control the communication media of the world and will skillfully organize mass publicity to promote his ends. He will manage the truth with guile beyond words, with lying beyond words, bending it, twisting it, and distorting it. He will mold world thought, and he will shape human opinion like so much potter's clay. He's going to be a bad guy, and he's going to convince everyone they need to follow the beast. So that's Revelation chapter 13. The world is looking for someone to be super duper. Why is our country so messed up? I'm guessing it's because God's letting everybody get messed up so that everything's get, everything gets so messed up, they're going to be looking for somebody to come in and solve the world's problems. And the Antichrist is going to be the, he's, he's going to be the one that does it. Because the world system has rejected the true and living God. America has rejected the Christian heritage that we know about, but modern day historians in America are rewriting history. And they're teaching it to our young people and it's, it's, it's lies. They're not learning the truth. They're not taught the truth anymore. So I hope today that everyone in this room knows Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you don't, you made the biggest mistake you could ever make are the worst decision you're ever going to make. Because you will not be able to get into heaven. I don't care what you think. What you think doesn't matter. It's what God says. I had this guy over in a nursing home over here. He was sitting out in the pavilion, and he says, Hey, I already worked it out with God. We got a deal. 
I'm going to get into heaven. I, I worked out a deal with God. And I said, you're crazy. I went out and bought him a brand new Bible. I spent about $45, $50 on that Bible. I said, I want you to start reading right here. And I told him where to read. The next time I went to see him, I says, where's your Bible? He says, oh, I lost it. You lost it. So I got to asking around. One of the nurses said, oh, he sold it to somebody for $35. He's got it all worked out. He's dead now, by the way. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. I thank you for the fact that you take the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Lord, I thank you for the fact that you've given us the Word of God, though, that even foolish things can share the truth. I pray for anyone in this room who's never come to Christ. Lord, they may have been in church all their lives. Nice people. But their response would be, oh, I've always been a Christian. Lord, we know we can't always be a Christian. I haven't always been married. So Father, we pray now that you'd use the truth of your word to prepare us to love you and to walk with you and Lord, to live expectantly as if you're going to come and get us today because you might do it. And for anyone who hears this and they've never come to Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray that you would, out of love, terrify them until they come to the truth and experience the peace that passes all understanding, knowing that they're right with you, they're a child of God. And Lord, you promise I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, and nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please, Lord, be glorified in and through our lives and help us to love you with all of our heart and soul and strength. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen.